Hi everyone and welcome to the LGBTIQA plus and Mental Health Collab Lab. Um, my name is Erin Halligan. I'm the Director of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention at the LGBTIQ plus Health Australia. My pronouns are she, her, um, and I identify as someone with lived experience of mental illness and suicide. My background is mainly in mental, Ill mental health and suicide prevention in both government and uh, community sectors. Um, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we come together. I'm meeting from the Wiradjuri Nation. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to recognise that sovereignty of this land was never ceded and always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, and so, welcome everybody. Um, I hope everyone's well at the different places of the country. Um, we've got a big audience here and I know you're all from different areas um, with different disciplines and roles. Um, this is excellent because the spirit of today's session is to learn as much as possible about interdisciplinary collaborative care and by the end of this session, we'll hope, hope to have both an increased confidence to participate in interdisciplinary collaborative care when responding to LGBTIQA plus mental health presentations and a better understanding of how interdisciplinary collaborative care can contribute to better outcomes for LGBTIQA plus community, community members who are experiencing mental health issues. Um, today we'll be working in three parts. In part one, we'll be together in this main meeting room. I'll provide you with an overview of the field of LGBTIQA plus and mental health um, with a particular focus on, you know, why it's important that we talk about mental health within our community and particularly the most recent impacts of the COVID um, pandemic on our community and how it has exacerbated the vulnerabilities to mental illness and suicide. Um, part two is where, um, as they say here, the fun begins. Um, you'll be you'll move to moderated breakout rooms where you'll be tasked, there'll be a task to collaboratively develop a mental health plan for a vignette developed specifically for this activity, you'll be in safe hands. The moderators we've um, selected for this task, I'll introduce to you shortly. Um, and I'll also be dropping in and out of the rooms to sort of touch base and see what's happening for us to all have a come together talk at the end. Um, and that leads you to the part three, where we'll turn to the main meeting room and share our learnings and insights about the challenges, merits and hurdles to engaging with collaborative care in our community. Um, I might get Emily to jump in now just to talk through how we can uh, interact with the um, with the technology. Thank you so much, Erin. Welcome, everybody. Um, so just a reminder, in part one and three, you can find the chat box located to the right-hand side of your screen, and this can be used to engage with your other delegates and peers. Um, from here, you can also send your de other delegates direct messages. Um, certainly as well, please pop into the chat or the QA box if you have any technical issues, and we'll be here to support as well. Just a reminder, your chat box is located on that right-hand side of your screen. It should be that first icon, and the Q&A is located just below that. Throughout the session, you may also be asked to complete a poll, and that's the fourth icon down as well. Again, if you have any trouble locating these or have any tech issues throughout, please don't hesitate to pop it in the chat, and we'll be there to support. Thanks, Erin. Great. Thanks, Emily. And I'll uh, put my my hand up to ask for your support if anyone else has any issues in the day. Um, I'm mindful of the large numbers that we have for the interactions in um, the beginning and the end sessions as we'll all be coming together. Um, and this will be limited to the chat feature. Um, we won't be fielding content questions from here. Um, you could send them via direct message or to an individual delegate. Um, and again, if you want any advice from Emily, you can also put that in the chat function um, as well. Um, in the part two areas, there'll be a lot of interactivity and each moderator will negotiate how this happens directly with the breakout rooms. Um, so one of your first tasks, make sure your camera's on, make sure your microphone's muted and follow the lead of the moderator to establish how you're all going to work together. 
Great. So I'd like to begin by providing some context to why it's so important to talk about mental health and suicide for the LGBTIQ plus community and also reflect on the particular adverse impacts COVID um, has had on our community. So next slide, please. Uh, and I'd also like to begin by acknowledging people with lived experience. Um, the individual and collective contributions of those with lived experience um, are essential to co-designing and delivering the, the work that we do. Um, and um, every, every individual journey is unique and is, value, is a valued contribution to our commitment to the um, mental health and suicide prevention programs and advocacy. And I'd like to um, recognise and thank everyone um, here today who might be, you know, involved or have experiences or lived experience in um, it, however many ways, shape or form with mental health and suicide. Um, so next slide please. So why is it important we talk about LGBTIQ plus mental health? Um, although many lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer people and other sexuality and gender diverse people live healthy and happy lives, a disproportionate number experience poorer mental health outcomes um, and have a higher risk of suicidal behaviours compared to the broader population. It's important to note that not all LGBTIQ plus experiences are a mental illness and not all LGBTIQ plus people experience the stress about their sexuality or gender identity. Um, the adverse health income, uh, outcomes can be seen often directly related to stigma, prejudice, discrimination and abuse experienced due to being part of our diverse community. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here are some sobering facts for you to have a look at. As you can see, the rates of mental illness and psychological distress, suicide and suicidality are exponentially higher than the general population. Um, this information I have here has been collected by uh, LGBTI, LGBTIQ plus Health Australia and um, in its suicide data snapshot and um, consolidates evidence that we've um, put together with um, in our private lives report with uh, La Trobe University. Um, it's important to note in, in that, that this is privately um, independently collated data as um, rates of mortality is currently not reflected in ABS causes of death data nor in any other health data. As such, this, this places significant limitations on any real trends and subsequent funding and investment into mental health and suicide prevention programs and services and our understanding of um, the circumstances and impacts on the community more broadly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and yeah, so why are there worse outcomes for LGBTIQ plus people? Uh, LGBTIQ plus people are exposed to many experiences and factors that might not exist for um, non-LGBTIQ plus people. Basic experiences that tend to increase a person's vulnerability in society are often more present. Um, this can include homelessness, financial insecurity, poverty, workplace distress, unemployment, family and domestic violence, social isolation, clinical mental illness diagnoses, poor access to primary health, and poor access to mental health care. These vulnerabilities are compounded in times of heightened environmental risk and disasters where the experiences of these risks are escalated. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'd like to talk to a study that LGBTIQ plus Health Australia has recently uh, done in partnership with the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society at La Trobe University. Um, and it looks at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on LGBTIQ plus people in Australia and their mental health, as well as rates of family and domestic violence and economic situations. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, the report highlights the challenges and health disparities of um, uh, that are already experienced by LGBTIQ plus people prior to the pandemic that have been further exacerbated during the pandemic. 
um, in the face of the new challenges. These findings uh, will be used to address the unique and challenging needs of people going forward and now in future crises. Uh, we often reflect on circumstances with flooding and climate change and broader uh, social and environmental impacts that um, you know, uh, can be identified with the same level of touch point for the vulnerabilities of our community. And this report is looking to kind of inform, you know, inform our responses going forward. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see from this data, um, almost two thirds of participants felt that their health and wellbeing had gotten worse um, since the beginning of pandemic. Um, of these respondents um, who had received a previous mental health diagnosis, 71% um, recorded their, their condition worsening. Uh, the group participants highlighted that the changes in their financial situations, their so so social isolation and, so and unsafe living environments were often the driving force for a de decrease in their health and wellbeing. More than half of the participants experienced some form of change to their employment circumstances during the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, almost one-fifth experienced violence from an intimate partner during the pandemic and more than a quarter experienced violence from a family member. Most participants reported less social interaction with the families of origin, chosen family and friends, but 75% 0.8% also recorded an increase in the use of social media um, and online platforms, which is a, a good buffer for this social isolation, given that we already know that is a significant part that already impacts the mental health and suicidality of, of people in the LGBTIQ plus community. Additionally, the use of tobacco, alcohol and other drugs increased with over 83% of participants con who consumed alcohol um, and consuming more during the pandemic period. Um, so what I'd like to recognise again is this data is obtained through independent research. Um, LGBTIQ plus data continues to re remain uncaptured in Commonwealth Health data and as such there continues to be limitations in our understanding um, when um, being able to uh, apply any of what we know and what we understand to proper investment and service provision for our community. Um, the government policies consistently reflect LGBTIQ plus people as a priority population. So there obviously is broader recognition by government that this is an area that needs to be addressed. And, you know, we need to have a priority for more work to be done on this, particularly data, to, to resolve this issue. Um, currently, the National Suicide Prevention Office is developing a new National Suicide Prevention Strategy, which we are closely working with them on to make sure that we include some of these recommendations and the findings of this report. Um, if you go to the next slide, I have put in there um, some brief detail on our, on our website where you can find the report, but I'm also happy to circulate um, the um, resource information, as I can see that coming up as a question for um, people more generally um, on the on our website on the, and on Latrobe's website. So that's my uh, background to the um, to the presentations. So I thought I should now introduce you to our moderators. Um, so we have Nova Delaney, um, who is a consultant psychologist and a board approved supervisor um, that operates exclusively in the field of e-health telepsychology provision in Australia. Emma Love, who works with Diverse Voices, an LGBTIQ plus peer helpline. Um, Emma's experience in mental health and wellbeing with the LGBTIQ plus community. Brent Mackey, who is the Director of Policy Strate Strategy and Research at the AIDS Council of New South Wales. He has experience um, and expertise in communications, population health, sex, sexual health, drug and alcohol, and mental health policy and research. And Zan Maida, who has extensive experience in narrative practice um, and currently works with the Dulwich Centre. 
So welcome everybody and I won't, you will obviously have more detail to talk to about your respective careers and expertise in your breakout rooms. So I'll uh, leave it there. Um, and I um, would like to get perhaps Emily to jump in to um, get you out all into your groups. to pop into each of your groups and it seemed like everyone was really engaged and dynamic and um, I've just noticed here that there's a comment about it being the most emotional um, session and I really just want to pick up on that because, you know, talking about these particular case studies and vignettes is a really kind of a, um, a intimate experience and, you know, it's always important when we talk about mental health um, that we do check in and just, like, reflect on sort of, you know, individually stuff that we've talked about and how it may impact us as people with lived experience or people who might just be newly absorbing information. And so, yeah, so, I, you know, I just, um, you know, reiterate just being able to have some space for yourself to, to regroup um, if you need it. Um, having, said, having said that, we are needing to push on the time a little bit. Um, so I managed to pick up on some great sort of topics just off the little bits that I've heard. And what's been really interesting is picking up on some of the issues around intersectionality and the need for collaboration across services and picking up on where existing services um, are, can be better uh, connected with the community and how we can better support them to be able to engage. Um, but I will um, throw to my um, our, my team of people who, well, not my team, the pe team of people who are um, conducting the session. So, um, Nova, would you like to start? You're on the top of my list, so apologies. Sure. So I think uh, the group with my vignette, uh, we, we really sort of really tried to explore and understand uh, how to check our assumptions, um, understand that we may not or accept that we may not know what we're, we're, we're doing or be as culturally competent as we need to be uh, and be as client-centred as we really can. So going from this bottom-up approach of how the individual uh, is interpreting themselves, their world, their priorities uh, and where they're wanting to work. Um, it was a very complex vignette and I, I do thank the, the group for sort of sitting with the complexities and how there was just a lot of things to challenge and think about and um, the humility that was within the room uh, around just trying to do the best with what we have uh, and what we know uh, and being really quite humble within that. Yeah, great. Thank you. That sounds sounds like a great outcome for that. Um, Emma? Yeah, there was, um, I think, a, a, a real sense of overwhelm in terms of the complexities um, felt by our delegates in my breakout room. Um, there were, again, same as sort of Nova in that, um, my vignette was quite complex and there was a lot going on. Um, there's a lot felt in terms of um, the collaborate, collaboration between all service providers and, uh, you know, what might be available in a city versus regional as well um, and how to manage those sorts of things, um, focusing on, like, how to stabilise a person and uh, all the different complexities and levels in which that um, would need to occur and the, the barriers that they face as well. So in terms of, you know, um, you might have all of these excellent providers, but they all have extremely long wait lists um, or available at different times as well. So, um, yeah, so that that was very difficult. We all sort of agreed that um, providing a, a wraparound support and um, safety net for the person would be very beneficial um, and that that's where a lot of us would start. Um, but being able to effectively do that with the barriers um, and that uh, the lack of those um, providers being in place, especially ones that are trained um, and knowledgeable within the rainbow community, um, was certainly felt, yeah. Great. Thank you. 
Um, and Brent? Um, yeah, um, we had a, a, a great discussion in, in um, my um, breakout room. Um, and, and again, um, we, we really looked at a, a range of, obviously we, we had a, a, a the, vin, the person in the vignette had multiple issues and uh, the intersectionality of a whole lot of um, various uh, components of their life um, impacting on, on on the issues for that, that person. So we really looked at um, ways that um, uh, services could, could um, uh, become more inclusive um, uh, and more uh, under, understanding of the, of the issues for LGBTI people, but also um, because the vignette uh, also overlapped into um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Islander communities, how we can work with the person in the vignette um, to to um, work with those communities in terms of building a, um, a recovery plan for, for them, um, which is really heartening to see um, from the discussion in the group. Um, we really talked about uh, uh, obviously, how to prioritise um, what was important and how to work with with the person in, in, in the vignette in, in terms of working on uh, how to first, uh, you know, uh, developing inroads into um, uh, uh, providing services for them um, and getting them into services, um, which was, you know, it, it's a complex. It was a complex area, um, uh, much like Emma and. Um, uh, Nova's uh, vignette, and so um, we talked around where we would go with that. But um, really, I think um, it's developing a a, a, um, a care plan that that looked at a multiple range of of services engaging with 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 this person, including mainstream services, but possibly specialist LGBTI or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services. Um, looking at a, a form of case manager or, or process. Um, I think there was a discussion around a really um, interesting sounding service in Victoria um, around, um, uh, I, I think it was called Multiple and Complex Needs Care uh, um, uh, uh, admission, um, but working around that management plan um, involving a range of different services to, to, to work with the, with the person in question. Um, yeah, but also acknowledging, I mean, importantly, that these, these services have to have to be understanding of and inclusive of LGBTI people and other uh, cultural and uh, community um, factors that have come into play. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Brent and Zan. Thanks, Erin. Uh, we were speaking about a, a non-binary neurodivergent young person of colour living with chronic illness, um, which, you know, sounds like a lot of things, also sounds like most of the people that I work with. Um, so really a common uh, combination of experiences and identities. Um, in particular, one of the things we spoke a lot about was the intersection of transphobia and racism um, the experience of experiencing racism within LGBTIQ services and communities and the kinds of expectations that both mainstream and LGBTIQ services might have around coming out that can be, um, you know, essentially like centering white experiences and maybe a really inappropriate kind of binary for people of colour, uh, people with um, cultural communities that are not from the white Christian Judeo complex. Um, we, we spoke about the importance of having services that can support families, uh, which again, when we have, um, you know, individualized support, that can be something that really falls short um, and can make a huge difference in terms of um, safety of trans young people in particular, but also well-being, um, because, you know, especially when we're thinking about the pandemic and young people um, being at home with families who may not know how to use their preferred name and pronouns, um, that can be a highly stressful experience um, without the opportunity to move into community spaces where they are being referred to in their preferred ways and seen in those other parts of their experience. Um, I think that really as well, we just acknowledged that the idea of trying to facilitate interdisciplinary care is not at all easy when we're thinking about this stuff. It's a totally different conundrum if you're in a metropolitan region versus a regional area. 
um, because in regional and remote areas, the, the services just don't exist. Um, the safety concerns are different um, and it can be really hard work um, trying to um, imagine who we might refer folks to and whether that's going to be a safe enough kind of service. So what's our responsibility as practitioners to kind of go above and beyond and um, do the work of finding out about what are the practices of these services that we're referring to? What is their level of skill and competency? What do they need to know about the name and pronouns um, that, you know, are used by the folks that we work with and in what circumstances um, in order to keep them safe? Um, so, yeah, I guess the only one other thing I'll mention, which I think is really important to consider is um, considering sexual violence services and, and such, you know, obviously domestic violence services would fit within this as well, but services that are likely to be um, quite binary gendered centric and what it might look like for non-binary folks navigating those services, especially for folks who've experienced sexual violence from women or trans folks. Um, obviously, queer and trans people experience um, sexual violence at comparable and higher rates as um, cis women. So uh, if we are not ensuring that those services can not make assumptions about the gender of the perpetrator and things, um, we can make sure that they are more inclusive. Um, anyway, there's a lot, there's a lot of work we've all got to do. Woohoo. Woohoo. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, guys. That was really good. And I think, um, I mean, I think so a few takeaways. Firstly, um, the word complexity and complex has obviously come up in each of your feedback. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to pick up on because I think often in our, in the world where the LGBTIQ plus people, um, you know, service providers and community workers, we kind of become um, a little bit lost in how complex uh, the, the group is, our community is. Um, and it is, we're talking about, you know, what they say, diversity within diversity. We've got in LGBTIQ plus people, we've got all these people from all backgrounds with all different needs and being able to come up with, with particular situations and yet vignettes where, like you said, Zan, although it sounds complex, this is sort of people that we engage with often and all the time and these are the people who sort of present in a, you know, f f first and foremost in needing support because of all these barriers. So um, I'm really glad that that was picked up on and I'm really grateful that everyone kind of was able to engage and, and, um, and you know, feel compelled to contribute even though there was that huge complexity there um, and noting as well the, the emotional toll that takes in those discussions. Um, I think that the two the two bits that I can identify what have come up with was the idea around wraparound services and taking um, um, person centred approaches to uh, care and looking at how to connect existing services and provide inroads um, for collaboration with stuff that's already happening. Um, having care plans for people to be able to like move through the system and identifying where the barriers might be that we could improve um, the service system to help support the support the community better. Um, I think the other area that we talked about a lot was the intersectionality of um, of the community and intersectionality across uh, different areas. I think we talk. I noticed people were talking about racism and um, sexual violence and gender, and then you know, just you're saying then you know, um, Aboriginal community groups um, and how the challenges are in being able to connect those levels of um, of uh, vulnerability that are, that coexist already with the, with the um, vulnerabilities that the LGBTIQ plus people already have, um, and these are big questions. You know, these we don't have answers to these, and so that's why these discussions are really good and important. And I'm really, really um, motivated that everyone's kind of been out to have these these um, yeah these meetings and talks. Um, so. Now, where are we at? So that's, we've summed that up. I think we've got a bit more time. Um, was there anything else, um, Emily, that we needed to touch base on? I know some people were doing some polls. Um, do they get reflected anywhere? 
Hi, everyone. Yeah, the polls and the breakout rooms, um, they're not currently in this session. Um, but what we would love to encourage everyone to do is get started on the event survey. So that's just located on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and it's available there to start completing. Um, but certainly, Erin, if there wasn't anything else, I can um, let everyone know what's coming up next as well. Yeah, look, I just wanted to, again, take the opportunity to um, make sure that we all take some space to reflect on things that we've talked about today, to be able to um, have some self-care and recognise that all these conversations are very challenging um, and confronting and we're talking about things that are very um you know, distressing for a lot of people and distressing for people to hear about should you not have been exposed to these stories before. Um, and also to people with lived experience of mental illness and mental uh, distress and suicide and suicidality. Um, you know, m myself as someone with lived experience, being able to engage in these conversations in a, in a strong way can sometimes require some fortitude. And so I'm really grateful for people with lived experience, particularly who've come today to be able to, to provide that input and to feel, you know, I hope supported and, and encouraged by these conversations. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, if anyone has sort of further feedback that they would like to provide in relation to that, by all means, you know, put something in the chat or reach out via one of the messages. Um, and I note that there is a guided mindful session, mindfulness session, which will be beginning 15 minutes for 15 minutes at 5.15. Um, so that's also a good opportunity for, you know, yourself as, um, you know, to personally kind of take some time to reflect. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I just, other than that, I'm really um, grateful and thankful for you all participating today and hopefully you got something good out of it. And I'd like to thank Zan, Brent, Emma and Nova for all their work and development of the vignettes as well because they were quite um, comprehensive and, um, like, from what, what I heard and the little bits that I attended were very well managed and had lots of good conversations. So, um, yeah. Thank you, everybody. And um, if you want to finish off, Emily, about the surveys.